One of the central themes that's running throughout all of Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women, and really a lot of her other works as well, is this notion that inequality is a central problem for modern civilized society, and it has to be dealt with. In order to deal with it, it has to be identified as such, and we have to think about how it's generated, how it's perpetuated, and how it might be addressed. And so she's providing answers to all of those. She's also taking on people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and saying that although their analysis was correct in certain respects, it's fundamentally wrong in other respects and that it's left out some vital things from the picture, namely the inequality that's been imposed upon women. Now, what I want to start with is actually her, her critique of Rousseau and build off of that. She's got this great passage where she says, Rousseau exerts himself to prove that all was right originally, a crowd of authors that all is now right, and I that all will be right. So she's saying Rousseau is saying that the past was right, but the present is screwed up. A lot of people are saying that the present is just great, couldn't be any better. I'm saying, no, the present is screwed up, the past is screwed up, the future is, is where things are going to be right, if we actually set them right. So what does it take for that to, to happen? Um, well, in order to answer that, first we have to see how we got from the past to the future. And Rousseau tells a kind of story about this that, that Wollstonecraft is going to consider and say, yeah, it's right in certain respects, but also fundamentally wrong in other respects. So Rousseau begins with this, this state of nature in which human beings are essentially solitary, undeveloped beings, and eventually they start to form societies. They do so. He's got a whole long you know, uh, discussion about how this occurs, and you can see this in some of the other videos. I don't need to rehearse this here. But they arrive at a, a stage of primitive society, the kind of societies that we see our ancient ancestors creating. Um, you know, Rousseau uses Sparta as, as an example. And in those societies, there are going to be inequalities. Inequalities of a couple different forms. There's inequalities of personal merit. Some people are better than others. Sometimes it's personal merit in terms of who can run the fastest or who can, you know, hunt the best. Or it could be in terms of, you know, moral qualities. Who has the most self-control? Who has the strongest developed sense of justice? Who is the most courageous? But there's inequalities as well of three other key things. One of them is wealth. Whatever ends up being property for that society ends up functioning as a kind of exchange, but also a marker that indicates to people who matters, who can buy, who can purchase, who can exchange. And, and wealth tends to substitute for the other sorts of inequalities, uh, Rousseau says. Those other inequalities are power or authority. So imagine you know, when somebody's placed over somebody else. It could be in a family where one person is, is in charge and the other people have to, to obey them. It could be in a workshop. It could be in terms of political authority could be a hunting party where somebody's calling the shots, somebody's put in charge. And then another distinction is of uh, nobility or rank. Some people are felt to be of uh, better blood or quality. They're, they're somehow distinguished from the others in terms of rank. And these can, you know, these can actually be quite jarring with each other. You know, wealth can compete with rank, as we see and happen in a lot of ancient societies. But although there's inequalities there, Rousseau thinks that human beings are actually better human beings in a state of primitive society. There, I should put over here, there are the best human beings in the state of nature. But in primitive society, they're still pretty good. They haven't developed too many of the human passions. They do have a tendency to compare against each other, which is going to lead to a lot of problems. But they are relatively happy, relatively healthy but when we transition to civilized society, everything goes, goes down the tubes. So in a civilized society, we have much greater inequalities. They end up being masked by all sorts of social processes. 
um, property and laws get introduced, but they don't really help out the people that they're supposed to be protecting, like the poor or those who, who are vulnerable. And human beings in general become much worse in civilized society, according to Rousseau, uh, in, in moral terms. Their, their passions develop so that they, they become obsessed with having power over other people, being given little distinctions that, that elevate them above their, their fellows. You know, if you want to put this in workplace terms, think of the person who is totally obsessed with what their job title is and, you know, getting to control the supply cabinet or something like that. And Rousseau says, well, that's what people in civilized society tend to be like. The bosses tend to be jerks. Um, the rest of us tend to be jerks. We're all sort of, you know, making each other worse by, by our own misery and unhappiness. It's one big ball of human nature having developed, but having developed in bad ways. So what does Wollstonecraft say about this? She says Rousseau actually got it wrong. How did Rousseau get things wrong? We're going to look at each, each part of this. First off, he's saying, you know, we should, you know, be in a state of nature. That would be great. She says, we wouldn't develop our human capacities at all in that state. What is Rousseau actually thinking? You know, lauding that as, as the ideal. Human beings are supposed to develop. We were given this capacity for self-improvement so we could actually use it and make something of ourselves as individuals and as a species. Um, Primitive society. Is primitive society going to be better? We'll, we'll look at that in a moment. What about civilized society? So, what Wollstonecraft says is what we take to be civilized society isn't really such. It's better to think of it in terms of, let's call it, not yet civilized society, where it's actually inheriting a lot of things from the barbarism that precedes it. It's carrying that stuff through, and if we're going to get any better, we actually have to be in real civilization, which doesn't fully exist at this point. We can say that some societies um, are more civilized than others. Uh, in Wollstonecraft's time, she probably would be willing to say that in some respects, England uh, or the, well, the United States wasn't around quite yet, but um, if, you know, if she were able to see it, she would have said that those are, are more uh, fitting the mark than, say, France, France perhaps more than, than Germany. Germany definitely more than Russia at the time. Um, you know, we could, we could measure this in part by looking at the development of equality in various societies today. So, you know, how, how civilized is a society? It really depends on the types of equality that have been built into it. So let's look at what she actually says now in her own words. She says, the civilization of the bulk of people of Europe is very partial. It may be made a question whether they have acquired any virtues in exchange for innocence equivalent to the misery produced by the vices that have been plastered over unsightly ignorance and the freedom which has been bartered for splendid sl slavery. She's saying Rousseau actually got it right. There's a desire of dazzling by riches. People want to spend a lot of money to, you know, be big shots, um, to have people sucking up to them. You know, she talks about sycophants. That means suck-ups or brown nosers as we call them these days or your entourage, right? Um, and he, she says, many other complicated, low calculations of doting self-love have contributed to overwhelm the mass of mankind. They make liberty a convenient handle for mock patriotism. And she says, rank and titles are held to be of the utmost importance. So we're living, according to her, in a state of not yet civilized society where people are obsessed with rank, with power, with wealth, 
but their self-image. And there's a lot of inequality still left in there because these are things that by their very nature have to be unequal. Um, and, and the inequalities that we have with them can often be quite arbitrary, unfair, and when that happens, then people aren't too happy about it. So she says, this has been the wretchedness that has flowed from hereditary honors, riches, and monarchy. Um, you know, what is Rousseau responding to? Rousseau's saying, yeah, the current situation really is pretty bad. Rousseau's wrong in thinking that going back to an original state of nature is, pref is somehow uh, the preferable option. And he's also wrong to be lauding primitive society, as she says. Um, you know, she says, Rousseau celebrates barbarism, and he forgets that in conquering the world, the Romans never dreamed of establishing their own liberty on a firm basis or extending the reign of virtue. So, you know, these primitive societies, they look pretty good, but if you had to live in them, you probably wouldn't be that happy because when you look at them carefully, not everybody is free in them. A lot of people are living as, as slaves, a lot of them are, are suffering under rather arbitrary punishments that are coming from the Lord up on the hill who calls the shots or the priests that are telling the people what to do. And that actually carries itself forward into civilization, according to, to her. Um, she says that disgusted with artificial manners and virtues, the sort of things that goes on in, in modern society, the citizen of Geneva, that's Rousseau, instead of properly sifting the subject, threw away the wheat with the chaff. What does that mean? We talk about throwing the baby away with the bathwater. He throws away civilized society because of the things that are wrong with it when it's not yet fully civilized. So instead of looking further to where it should be going, he ends up saying civilization is no good. He, he should have asked whether the evils were the consequence of civilization, this sort of thing, or the vestiges, the leftovers of barbarism. That's an important question. Wollstonecraft is saying, actually, what's going on there is everything that's wrong with civilized society is just barbarism that hasn't yet been brought into the realm of real civilization, which is going to involve genuine equality and is going to require the development of virtue, where virtue is going to be the primary mode of distinction among people. So, how does she explain this? She says, um, there we go. In the infancy of society, when men were just emerging out of barbarism, so at this point, chiefs and priests touching the most powerful springs of savage conduct, hope and fear, must have had unbounded sway. So some people had authority, right? And they were, they were uh, war leaders, and they were religious leaders, priests. And they fight with each other for a long time, and eventually somebody wins out, and whoever wins out, they're the one who, who decides you know, what the institutions are going to look like, how the society is going to be structured, they call the shots, they establish themselves at, at the, the apex, and then power flows downward in both um, kingly, or you know, um, we might say governmental, and priestly, or religious uh, hierarchies. So she says, an aristocracy is the first form of government, then monarchy and hierarchy break out of the confusion of ambitious struggle, struggles, and the foundation of both is secured by feudal tenure. So what we have is a feudal system going on here, where there's an entire set of layering of, of ranks and duties and power flows downward from, from the top, all the way down to the people at the bottom who are pretty miserable. So she says, um, this can't be the case for too long. As we're moving this way, the people acquire some power in the tumult, and that obliges the rulers to gloss over their oppression with a show of right. And so far we're here where Rousseau has been describing in his own stuff, where the, the rich, the powerful, the, the people who have authority create institutions that seem to be fair, that seem to make a level playing field, but don't actually do so. But Wollstonecraft is saying, well, that's not the, the, where the story should end then. 
why don't you actually level the playing field? If that's really the case, if that's the problem, that it just seems to be a level playing field but isn't really a level playing field, then fix it. And that's what civilization will do. That's what civilization, the process of civilization, will encompass. There's another problem, though. What is it? What's been left out of this entire picture? As we moved all the way through here. There's been a class that's been oppressed, that's been subordinated, that has been left out of the picture this entire time. Women. Inequality exists, not in the state of nature, if there is such a thing, because uh, everybody's more or less in the same, you know, rude, solitary condition at that time, so you don't have inequality. But as soon as we move to primitive societies, if you actually do ethnographical studies and you put aside, you know, all these sort of things that we don't have an awful lot of evidence for about there being some sort of universal matriarchy preceding, you know, the shift to patriarchy. If you actually look at the historical uh, stuff that we've got, it looks like most societies actually have been patriarchal. And what does patriarchy mean? It means that men, regardless of what their moral condition is, are made dominant to women. And there could be, like, you know, women in higher statuses than lower-class men, but those women are still, in some respect, subject to men who are above them, and they don't have full rights and, and, and uh, full capacities to develop as human beings. This continues through civilization. She's faulting guys like Rousseau for being, in, in certain respects, hypocrites, for talking an awful lot about how you know, bad modern civilized society is because it, it introduces even more inequalities, but then wanting to maintain those very same inequalities with respect to the relation between men and, and women. So a few passages are, are, are kind of important to look at um, with respect to this. So, you know, she's talking, or yeah, she's talking about um, acquiring manners before morals as, as a fundamental problem. And she says that, um, you know, women who are in the upper classes end up basically just being tokens that are exchanged. They're not treated as full persons. You just got this wonderful passage, Riches and hereditary honors have made ciphers of women to give consequence to the numerical figure. What is that wonderful phrase mean? Well, a cipher is like a code or a symbol. So when we talk about riches and hereditary honors as having um, a numerical figure, what do we mean there? People are able to compare themselves against others. I have so much in the bank account, you have nothing. I have stocks, you don't have stocks. Um, we can do the same thing with, with honors. Women are often treated as one more commodity that can be not accumulated unless you, you, know, you're, you have a harem or something like that, but can be uh, traded, can be bought and sold, can be used as a means of exchange and a means of measure. So when we talk about, for example, a trophy wife, that's exactly what um, Wollstonecraft is, is, is talking about there. People essentially purchasing the affection and the loyalty of another human being on the basis of they're going to bring to them some more prestige. So she says um, what this introduces is a kind of, you know, ruling and, and mastery and slavery all under the guise of relations between people. So she says, um, here we go, uh, Idleness has produced a mixture of gallantry and, and despotism into society, which leads the same men who are the slaves of their mistresses, who, who will do what women want them to do when they want to have sex with them, when they want to have them on their arms, when they want to use them as a kind of conquest, 
to um, tyrannize over their sisters, wives, and daughters. This is only keeping them in rank and file, it is true. And so what she's saying there is, you know, no matter where we go within society, whatever stratus that we're at, stat, whatever strata or status, blended those two words into one thing, whatever stratus, um, women are in an inferior position, even at the upper levels. And women are half of the society, right? So this should matter quite a bit, but it doesn't seem to matter to these male social theorists. So she says um, men have increased that inferiority of, of women till women are almost sunk below the standard of rational creatures. And this gets to one of the ways in which that inequality is maintained within not yet civilized society and will be done away with once we get to real civilization. Uh, when, if women are treated as irrational or incapable of developing rationality, as we're going to see in some of the other videos, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, you know, what's the opposite of that? She says, let their faculties have room to unfold and their vir virtues to gain strength. Then determine where the whole sex must stand in the intellectual scale. Women are, are not yet ready to be evaluated because they haven't been allowed to actually grow and prosper as human beings freely, to develop autonomy, to develop the virtues and intellectual faculties. So she goes on and, and she, she talks about, um, this is a very important uh, passage, she says, it's time to effect a revolution in female manners to restore to them their lost dignity, and to make them as part of the human species labor by reforming themselves to reform the world. Real civilization is not going to happen by just changing the political order so as to give all men the vote. If you don't give women the vote, or to create uh, economic opportunity for men, but not doing so for, for women, she would say. And she says, you know, there's going to be a lot of resistance to this. She says, I know it will require a considerable length of time to eradicate the firmly rooted prejudices. It's going to require some time to convince women that they act contrary to their real interest on a large scale when they cherish or affect weakness under the name of delicacy and to convince the world that the poison source of female vices and follies in compliance to custom has been the sensual homage paid to beauty. Because women have been made into essentially sexual objects, um, or objects of affection, or objects of, of the male, you know, uh, gaze and exchange, they've been placed into a situation over and over and over again through generations where they're not able to fully develop. And because they haven't fully developed, they don't even realize yet what they're missing, unless there's somebody like Mary Wollstonecraft, a rather unusual case of her own time, but somebody who we can recognize as much more common in our own time, where we probably, you know, if she were looking at our society, she would have some quibbles with certain things, but she would say, on the whole, we've done a pretty good job of attaining that. The fact that more than half of my college students tend to be female, that's probably a case in point right there. Now, she's got this other great thing that she says about the, the path to real civilization, and this is what we'll end with here. She says, the two sexes mutually corrupt and improve each other. This I believe to be an indisputable truth extending to every virtue. She says, all the noble train of virtues on which social virtue and happiness are built should be understood and cultivated by all mankind, or they will be cultivated to little effect. So, so long as women are maintained in a position of inferiority, of subordination, of inequality that they're unable to, except with certain, you know, very unusual examples, break out of, we're not going to be able to make this transition here from the civilization that does seem to be rather barbaric and doesn't seem to be providing us with what we actually want and maybe making us all worse. We're not going to be able to make the transition to real civilization. So if if we're not going to fix this for women, and we're not going to allow women to truly develop as they ought to, and insist that men do at the same time, then maybe we ought to go back to primitive society. Maybe we'd be better off that way. But if there is the possibility of moving to real civilization, we should leave this behind 
and make the transition. That's what she's advising. That's how she thinks inequality will ultimately be dealt with. 